Hey fellow tennis nerds, I hope all is well. Welcome to This Week in Tennis. We will get into Madrid. That's the most pressing topic. Injuries, also some racket switches, the outlook for the French Open and much more. So stay tuned and thanks for watching. And if you like the work we do, please subscribe to the channel or support us on Patreon or this YouTube channel. You can also check out tennisnerd.net for racket info, news, previews, odds, and all things tennis. But let us start in Madrid. This was one of the longest tournaments it felt like I've watched. It was a long one. Uh, this extended Masters format over two weeks is not really bringing me the kind of tennis action I want. Maybe one reason for that is that there were a lot of withdrawals, a lot of injuries. I mean, Felix Auger Aliasim, I think he had two walkovers and one retirement on his way to the final. That's not how you want to go through a tournament. I mean, it's not his fault and he did really well. He was close to winning the tournament. Rublev was too good, I think, uh, just a very deserving winner. The most solid player, despite not sleeping for several days. He complained about that. He had a really rough week, but brought it onto the tennis court and did well. The way Ojer Aliasim survived in that final for so long was thanks to his huge serve and and a very clutch play, which is not really what we're used to seeing from him, maybe. So a good step for both of these players. Some worrying signs for tennis fans in general in terms of Sinner withdrawing from Rome. He withdrew from this tournament due to a hip injury. That is worrisome for the French Open. He's not playing Rome. Maybe he will play the French Open. Let's have all our fingers crossed. Tennis needs Sinner and Alcaraz. Both of them out of Rome. Alcaraz still with a lingering forearm injury. And as I've said in previous episodes, when this injury started, this thing can take a while to heal, like up to six months in the worst cases, depending on the nature of the injury. Obviously, since he was back to play so early, it's maybe not that serious, but it's still preventing him from playing uh, tennis now in Rome. I will also talk about Alcaraz racket setup a little bit later so stay tuned for that and so both of these guys getting ready for the french open we need them there i can hear uh, a certain novak djokovic chuckle in the background but he's had his own drama with kind of firing part of his team and not playing so well this season there are rumors i don't know how confirmed these are of him uh, also quitting tennis after or retiring that's the nice word after the Olympics. I don't know if that's true or not. I've seen that in newsletters like the Craig Shapiro one who was on the podcast and as some other sources. So this might be uh, the season where we see both Novak and Rafa retire. That's highly possible by the sound of it, but things might change. Rafa's health is still a little bit of a mystery. Obviously he's not match 100% ready because he needs a lot of matches to get going, uh, but he is playing Rome and uh, he is getting a bit stronger with every match uh, as usual. Is it enough to be competitive at the French Open? I would doubt it, uh, which very much opens up uh, a pretty large pathway now and possibility for guys like Kasper Ruud and Stefanos Tsitsipas, who's both been in the final before, played either Novak or Rafa and lost. So um, this is an opportunity uh, now when we have so many lingering injuries might be a very open french open on the men's side time will tell uh, we'll update you with news every day on tennisnerd.net if we go to the women's tournament in madrid uh, it was a kind of blockbuster final sabalenka versus Sviontek. Sviontek got it done uh, made some distance between her and the second place in the rankings and deservedly so she is playing really well we know she loves the clay the madrid clay is a bit faster the whole conditions there high altitude and so on uh, makes the ball go through a bit quicker, but she managed well and uh, is the big favorite, I think, for the French Open, considering that it's played on clay. I don't see other players than Rybakina and Savalenka to challenge her. Uh, Coco Goff, obviously, always dangerous. There could be someone like Ons Jabour finding her form or even Sakari, but it does look like these three players will uh, fight for the French Open title, unless Daniel Collins just goes on a tier which he has but that would be a, a tough ask so these three players i think are now distancing themselves a bit from the rest of the pack in the on the wta tour but women's tennis is going strong and the product is uh, is quite powerful to to watch so uh, great for the sport let's hope that they can get their finances together as well on the wta side of things while we're on the topic of the wta tour we can get into madison keys new racket setup she plays with a blade 98 an older version i think the 2013 
I am not sure. I might be completely wrong. So please correct me in the comments or via Instagram, Tennis Nerd Insta. Uh, but she switched now her string setup and her racket according to Served Podcast with Andrew Roddick, one of my favorite tennis podcasts. So she's made the switch from an 1820 pattern uh, where she had gut in the crosses, I think, and all the power in the mains to uh, a full bed of all the power in a 6019 pattern. So she gets a bit more for free in terms of, of spin and launch over the net. Uh, and she goes full bed of polish. She has said that she doesn't like the feel and the sound as much as with gut. Gut has a specific sound when you hit the ball hard. And um, obviously the launch is a little bit lower and so on. Uh, but she does like how it plays. And she did well in Madrid. She reached the semis. Uh, where she lost to Sviontek and you can't say much about losing to Sviontek these days. Even getting a, a breadstick set against Sviontek is, is becoming quite common. So uh, not much to say about that. Madison Key is playing well. Uh, I've been getting a lot of questions about Alcaraz's setup. I mean, as you know, he's playing with a lighter racket. According to uh, friends, sources who are close to Alcaraz and who has held his racket, I cannot verify that this is 100% true because everybody is always saying, oh no, he must play with a 350 swing weight because he's a pro. No, there are many pros that don't play with 350 swing weights. I mentioned like Fritz, Dan Evans, playing below 330 swing weight. This is this is possible. Uh, and that's what's been speculated around, like that he's around 328 or something like that. Strong swing weight and uh, still decent on the pro tour, especially when you swing as fast as he does. And he plays with a stiff racket, the Aero VS most likely could be the Aero 98. No matter what, it's a stiff racket. I think there's many players who love the, the response from the Aero VS, but it is quite firm. There's not much dampening going on. He strings it with RPM Blast. I think 130 gauge at 55 pounds and 51 pounds in the crosses uh, to open up a bit more string movement. So that's 25 kilos mains, 23 kilos in the crosses. And that's a very firm setup. Like that's very firm on the arm. Uh, also with the lack of weight, if you had more weight, it might absorb more vibrations, but it won't be able to swing it as fast. So it's always a trade-off. It's also not easy to recommend him to go to a softer setup. Like many players have gone from full bed of poly. I mean, like Medvedev, I, I can mention so many players that gone full bed poly to uh, natural gut in the mains or crosses. I mean, Tommy Paul plays with the natural gut in the crosses. So many players try that. But in Alcar's case, which the way he plays seems not to work that well with a gut setup. I mean, the lower launch, uh, the way he puts so much pressure on the ball with every shot. Uh, it's hard to recommend him to do anything else. And I'm not in a position to really do that. But I think we might see him need to tweak something if these arm issues persist. Uh, might not be the racket setup. That might be fine. Uh, but I do get a lot of questions about it. And I think it's not the, the softest setup for the arm. And I think if you as a rec club level player, even on a pretty advanced level, would play with his setup, you'll probably feel your arm a bit after a while as well. And it's not only the racket in terms. I mean, Alcaraz has a very extended follow through where he kind of goes like this. I'm no biomechanic expert or whatever, but it, it does seem like he puts a lot of energy, a lot of effort, a lot of strain on his body with the way he plays tennis. And yeah, that's also definitely uh, helping his shots, you know, the way he kind of explodes into the ball and gets a lot on the ball. But it's taking a toll on his body. The way Sinner plays looks so much more effortless than Alcaraz. Obviously, all professional tennis players' bodies, uh, they ache and they have injuries and they're lingering niggles here and there. But uh, this case with the forearm popping up and the elbow being taped now several times, we've seen that it's not a positive sign for the longevity of his career. And we did talk about that with Rafa. Rafa was using so much force. He's still around, he's still playing. So it might still work out, but uh, it's something to think about for sure, because tennis is a very physical sport. We want to see the players healthy and they're all pretty much hurting. And I think that kind of segues straight also into the schedule of this like two week masters. Like um, it's good that you have a bit of more rest, but it also creates like a weird vacuum for some players that lose early rounds, like that they're no like an opportunity to play a, a decent ATP event the week after. They have to go to a challenger or something like that. And we saw in Sardinia that there was like 15 top 100 players in a challenger, which is great for the challenger tour. Uh, but it's also a little bit caused by there are no ATP tournaments because they're in Madrid. And it just felt very long. And I'm not sure that's the way to make sure that the players' bodies are healthier. The tennis schedule is getting increasingly more intense it seems like every year they don't have much of an off season they seem to cram in events 
in January now, even more events. They have team events. Now with, uh, you know, more sponsors coming in, maybe from this PIF, we will see more events. Uh, and uh, then it becomes an issue like where how do you plan your schedule if you won like 10 grand slams yeah you can afford to miss some events here and there but if you haven't won that many maybe you're in your start of your career and even if you won one or two slams like Alcaraz or Sinner then it's tricky um, to balance that schedule like you want to play obviously all the masters they kind of oblige to do that but they're really in an intense schedule and if, and if you make deep runs in several events in a row it puts a lot of toll on the body so Professional tennis is in a little bit of a conundrum. Like they, they need kind of fewer events, but then in many places on the tour, you don't make enough prize money, even if you're like 200 in the world, which is an amazing effort to be 200 in the world, but it's still tough to make a living from tennis. It's a complicated issue. Uh, I hope the ATP, WTA, they sit down and try to figure this out because we need the players to be healthy, especially these blockbuster guys that sell a lot of tickets. Uh, if they're not healthy, the tournaments lose out, um, the sport loses out, the fans lose out. So, yeah, we need to, to reconsider there. Talking about losing out, we are losing out on Diego Schwartzman, but not this year. 2025, Buenos Aires, ATP 250, that should be his last tournament. A very grand and nice career uh, by El Pecue from the word pequeño, this small guy, short guy, he's, uh, he's like 170 something, which is short on the ATP tour. And now that People look more like basketball players with long arms and leverage. Pekwe was always a guy with a strong smile and, and uh, played some amazing tennis in his career. He was ranked eighth in the world at his best, reached the semis at the French Open. So a big applause for Diego. If we go back to the racket topic a bit, uh, I'm here going to string up a Prince Phantom. This is the 100X 1820 pattern. So the denser version, 320 gram. Uh, interesting frame. I also have the 100X305 and the 100X290. A little bit lighter rackets, more open patterns. Henrik did review the 100X305 gram version very favorably in his review. I'm also going to try the 107, which he was not as excited about. And I will try the 100P, uh, which was my favorite from the previous Phantoms but uh, we will see if I still like it in this new kind of camo inspired cosmetic and with this new technology that is called Cylon. Curious about this, Phantoms to come, members will get first impressions pretty soon uh, as they always do. So big thanks to you guys who support via YouTube members and Patreon. Uh, you've also seen my recap from my latest ITF Masters tournament. Thanks for your support there, where I was lucky to reach the finals in both singles and doubles, but it didn't go all the way. But yeah, tournaments for me is kind of like personal therapy, especially racket therapy, because I'm always playing with different rackets. And I do enjoy playing competitions, even though it can feel like yeah, very frustrating sometimes. So I do urge you to do that as well. That's it for this week in tennis. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a nice day now and don't forget to play some tennis.